we need to dig deep. We need to find the roots of Leviathan, of the state, capitalism, and patriarchy. Look at the ways that they're all tied together, that they support one another, and get rid of them. Burn them down, transform them into other things, create new social relations that reflect you know, completely other logics based in solidarity, based in mutual aid, and so on. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonserviummedia If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 24th episode of the show. The podcast finished last year strong with an interview featuring social theorist and anarchist author Kevin Carson, and we're happy to also end this year with a bang. As usual, big thanks to everyone who makes this show possible, including our patrons and our growing team who help behind the scenes. In this episode, we were privileged to have the opportunity to chat with a well-respected author and activist who has poured his heart and soul into all things anarchy. This is dedicated to everyone who makes this project possible. When first hearing about anarchy and its aspirations, many people dismiss the idea as utopian, dangerous, and probably impossible. Now, most of them likely don't really understand what anarchism is as a political philosophy, But if you're an anarchist yourself, you've probably come across this knee-jerk reaction that lots of folks seem to have when first coming into contact with the idea. It's in those moments that I'm reminded of the quote attributed to Mikhail Bakunin. By striving to do the impossible, man has always achieved what is possible. Those who have cautiously done no more than what they believed possible have never taken a single step forward. Those words have always sort of had a reorienting effect on me because it reminds me that at one time, I also rejected anarchism, not realizing the extent to which my idea of the possible was molded by the power-worshipping context I grew up in. All this to say that a lot of work needs to be done if we want to move beyond a world defined by hierarchy and domination. But how do we actually go about expanding cooperation in a world obsessed with coercion? And what led humans to adopt these toxic ways of relating to one another to begin with? There's much to be learned and unlearned. In this episode, we discuss specifically how states were originally formed and how we can move beyond them. Without further ado, here's my interview with Peter Gelderlos. Peter Gelderlose is an anarchist, activist, and writer whose work has come to be known by many as foundational anarchist literature and essential canon for anarchist thought. The titles of his books are Worshipping Power, an Anarchist View on Early State Formation, The Failure of Nonviolence, From Arab Spring to Occupy, Anarchy Works, and How Nonviolence Protects the State. Peter Gelderlose, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. How's it going? Um, it's going all right. I mean, as well as things can be expected, I guess, with between a pandemic and a shitty economic situation and uh, and everything else. Yeah, for sure. I sent you a link to this meeting earlier, and Twitter didn't have the bandwidth. It blocked it from sending you a message, I guess, because I think Joe Biden was just announced as president. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so where are you living? Uh, I live in uh, in Catalonia, in a small town outside of Barcelona. Been here since uh, since 2007. Yeah, long long anarchist history there. Obviously, did you move there for political reasons? 
No, not exactly. Um, I My plan was to just travel around Europe for a year, learning from different anarchist movements over here. Uh, and towards the end of my trip, I got arrested in Barcelona at a squatter's protest um, and had to wait around two years for uh, for trial. And after that, it kind of became became home. Right. We had to actually postpone this meeting because you had a um, a general assembly you were going to. What's the anarchist or radical scene like there? Uh, it's it's not in a strong moment now, for sure. It certainly has a strong history and and a lot of potential. Uh, a lot of a lot of infrastructure, a lot of social centers, but at the at the moment, I don't think it's particularly handled well. The uh, the the pandemic, it's, it's sort of in this moment of a bit of a slump after after previous highs because there were very strong moments of struggle over the past years, some some important uprisings, and at the moment, it hasn't really been able to um, to to maintain that that activity. One of the main exceptions would be uh, around the housing struggle with with a lot of important work happening there. But for the most part, it's it's a bit um, bit of a quiet moment. Yeah. So what's your background? How, how did you become an anarchist? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess just seeing very obvious oppressions and hypocrisies uh, in in society around me. Uh, responding to those and seeing how how different power structures um, dealt with those responses, like you know, whether you know just authorities in high school or the police or, or whomever, you know, reading, learning history. It, it was just uh, I guess a process that happened on a, on a lot of different fronts. Did you grow up with sort of a, a leftist background though, or did you uh, did you grow out of um, I don't know your the way your household brought you up, or um, was it a rebellion against that? I mean, those those things always have an influence. Uh, my mom was a feminist, but but both my parents were were liberals while I was growing up. So yeah, there was definitely definitely an element of of rebellion against that, uh, especially in the sense of of just seeing how uh, just like how society didn't really give a damn about us or exist to to ensure us like any kind of uh, healthy, meaningful, or even even feasible life. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned earlier that you got in trouble there for a bit. Do you think that one has to have skin in the game in order to properly write uh, about anarchism? I think anarchism can be brought to bear on on any aspect of human existence from from pretty much any background. Uh, I mean, you know, you can you know you can bring anarchism to bear on on literary criticism or or visual arts or whatever. Uh, although really for it to have any any meaning and where it gets its meaning from is is through connection with with the struggle uh, against authority against oppression and so if if you know we're talking about anarchism in terms of its its contributions to social struggle then then definitely i mean there there have been academics who who try but it tends to fall short you know anarchism is all about people being the ones best situated to understand their own needs so as far as it comes to to social struggle, uh, yeah, if you're not participating in it, then I don't really know what you're doing, especially if you're trying to um, to, to talk about uh, anarchist struggle or anarchist involvement in social movements. So something that's seemingly very important, but often underemphasized by anarchists is state formation, uh, something that you've talked about quite a bit. Why is it important to know how states are formed and why did you decide to dedicate an entire book on the subject? Right. Um, it's extremely important for a variety of reasons. First of all, if we're talking about original state formation, the very first states to form, the, the very beginning of the process, the that theory has, has a huge impact. Even though it's dealing with things that happened hundreds or thousands of years ago, it has a huge impact on how we struggle right now. If, for example, we do our research and we come to the conclusion that uh, states basically evolved out of growing material inequalities in society, it grew out of class society, then then we would think that we can make our revolution, you know, uh, solely by trying to interrupt those processes of accumulation. And if we if we do our research and it turns out that that's not actually the case, then we would understand that um, trying to lead the, the lower classes, lead the working classes to take over the state and use it as a mechanism to get rid of capitalism is is destined to fail and is only ever going to reinforce capitalism. Um, so that I mean that just in terms of you know one of the great errors in revolutionary history of the 20th century 
comes comes down in part, or at least was was it was facilitated by just the absolutely simplistic and incorrect uh, understanding of the state that Engels developed and that Marx and Lenin helped to um, to spread. On a second level, it's it's really important to understand state formation because it's an ongoing process. It's not something that just happened once. In history, states are constantly creating resistance. They're constantly creating crises, and they're constantly falling apart. We can imagine just like this this zombie with its flesh constantly falling off of it. Its whole body is decomposing, and it needs to constantly keep devouring more forms of life just to keep going. So state formation is a constant process also because if we study state formation with an open mind, we see how important uh, strategic decisions of different social groups are, specifically the strategic decisions of the ones who become the ruling class. So they're constantly making decisions to increase their power, to overcome the resistance that they're constantly creating. And so a lot of the the mechanisms that we'll see in state formation 3,000 years ago, uh, we can also see in a similar but obviously changed form today. And then we can trace the, the evolution of these different strategies for state formation. Or also, you know, every every few years, a state somewhere collapses and because it's very important for the state that no corner of the globe ever be stateless, uh, then surrounding states will often cooperate to create a new state authority in this place where state power collapsed. For a very recent example, the Albanian state collapsed at the end of the 90s, and governments from, from across uh, Europe, uh, European Union governments, uh, collaborated to help uh, create a new a new state in Albania. Uh, also, a lot of um, European and North American interventions in Africa have to do with trying to um, prop up uh, these often very weak uh, neo-colonial states. And and so, state formation is is still very much a constant present day affair, both in terms of those who are who are fighting to extend the power of the state, and and for those of us who are who are trying to fight against the state. Mm-hmm. And can you expand on how states originally formed? There's no one model for how states originally formed. And I think that should be an important part of anarchist theory around the state, that we shouldn't have a singular theory in the sense of a model of this is how states form, because I think those models all end up being wrong whenever they're applied beyond like a few appropriate examples. They end up being uh, simplistic and and simply simply false in a lot of cases, whereas there are other cases in which they they do apply. So um, anarchist theorizing about state formation, I think, has to look at different pathways of state formation, different uh, potentials, and also the importance, like I said, of the strategic decisions of those in society who have more power and are trying to to monopolize uh, that power. One thing that we can say specifically with early state formation, I mean, this was this was a, a process of social evolution happening uh, on on different levels simultaneously, in which these different developments uh, they they had to they had to have some kind of synergy. They had to support one another, or or the whole thing was going to collapse. Because of course, you have a lot more failed states than you have states that successfully create themselves and project themselves over time. So basically, uh, when we're talking about you know different forms of development, we're talking about at economic, military, organizational, uh, political, spiritual, and environmental levels in a constant interplay. However, with the um, the earliest states, this sort of process of hierarchization tended to move slowest at the economic level. So so Marxists tend to to argue usually on the basis of outdated evidence. Or, or just simple assumptions that um, kind of out of like this sort of like materialist prejudice, like this, this sort of um, Western spirituality that can classify certain very immaterial things as material in out of like this, this desire to like kind of create the sort of this cult of, um, of objectivity. But anyways, um, the, that theory is based on class societies uh, leading to the accumulation of wealth that needs to be organized. But really, that was one of the steps that that developed more slowly in this process. I mean, the very idea of, of economic accumulation is a spiritual idea. That's not an objectively naturally existing idea. You can't, you can't even get the concept of wealth as, as we would understand it today 
or or have you can even have practices of economic inequality until you've already gone through really hundreds of years of work creating inequalities around status which is uh, of course very immaterial and can be ba- can be connected to kinship or other value systems and also inequalities on a spiritual level where a society's spirituality is not created in a horizontal way through the participation of all the members of society, but it's created by a specialized class. So these early ruling classes had very, very few, if any, material privileges, but they had uh, greater privilege and power in other areas, specifically when it came to status and to defining the spiritual values of their society. So those those activities were were necessary before it, it could even be possible to conceive of, of anything like material accumulation. So so again, you know, all, all of those different developments, they had to go hand in hand. But um, one of the earliest areas for development was related to uh, spirituality, kinship and status, uh, and then related to questions of justice, mediation, arbitration, trade, military organization, and also later on, uh, economic accumulation. Uh, but again, uh, you know, there's not, there's not one cookie cutter model for how states form. So states aren't just produced by, by social evolution. They're, they're the, re- um, the result of strategies and strategies to be effective have to, have to take advantage of uh, specific uh, local conditions. Right. It sounds like something uh, you you might want to dedicate a book to rather than simply just answering it uh, on a podcast. So, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, Keep in mind that this very long winded answer that I, that I just gave is nothing but like a 1% summary of of like a, a full, full answer. No, for sure. For sure. And a lot, a lot of good information in there. And obviously everyone should go check out your book on that. Some people point out that after the long period of humans living without a state, the first proto-states formed in a relatively short time of one another. Is there any merit to the idea that slow population growth and ecological degradation in some circumscribed stateless societies forced certain peoples to adopt more hierarchies and domination to get by? Conditions never forced society to adopt uh, more hierarchical forms of organization. Conditions created opportunities for incipient inequalities in a society to grow. But this this was not a mechanical process. It wasn't a natural process. Uh, In a situation where society is starting to face food scarcity, for example, because of population growth or changing ecological conditions, there's a huge range of responses that they can make to that. Uh, and and societies, you know, they'll, they'll, they talk about these problems. They discuss it. They're 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 not kind of blundering along unconsciously, but they um, they decide how to respond to that. They can respond by conquering their neighbors and trying to steal resources from their neighbors. They can respond by limiting population growth. Pretty much all stateless societies have have had and used means to to limit population growth. It's usually a um, a result of patriarchal and statist society that communities lose the ability to um, to keep their populations from growing unsustainably. They can decide to to get rid of this this incipient upper class that started to have more status and more um, more power. Uh, they can decide to blame them for for the the increasing scarcity and and try to uh, you know move towards some other more sustainable form of social organization, uh, or that incipient ruling class can get the jump on other people and decide to create some kind of scapegoat or sell some strategy to deal with population growth. For example, kidnapping a large number of people from a neighboring society, getting them to work more intensively to increase agricultural production. Uh, which is something that um, that happened in a lot of places. Uh, so yeah, changing changing ecological and technological conditions, things related to population, certainly created new opportunities, but it, it didn't make anything inevitable. Often you'll see, you know, two societies living side by side, facing the very same conditions, choosing opposite responses to those to those conditions. Uh, a society can become more anti-authoritarian in response to the very same conditions. What are some other theories on state formation that you find inadequate? 
I would say that the the more simplified understandings of of a materialist theory of state formation is completely wrong. So, like, if you take Engels seriously uh, and deal with how he talked about state formation, that just that just can't be backed up. However, you can take a materialist theoretical framework and use that as a very useful tool for helping explain certain aspects of, of state formation. Absolutely. So, so in that sense, it's really just like a question of like, at what level of complexity are you, are you taking this? And does this theory have to do all of the work for, for, you know, being the most valid or only valid theory of state formation? Or are you just allowing this to be one theoretical tool among among others? So, so the like the differing answers to those questions could mean that materialism is either completely invalid or or highly valid as as a theory, theoretical explanation. A couple a couple others that I that I deal with in worshiping power that I mention. So there there uh, there's a, a a rough primitivist theory that basically agricultural agriculture and sedentary living lead to state formation. Uh, I'd say that's a simplification because we have plenty of examples of of sedentary and and agricultural societies that were very anti-authoritarian that resisted state formation uh, until until they were conquered. We also have examples of nomadic pastoral societies being the the active agents of state formation, uh, with the caveat that um, you know the the act of state formation in those cases generally centers around conquering like a sedentary agricultural population to serve as like the new productive lower classes. But the ones who actually created the organizational forms and the hierarchical values and, and military technologies necessary for that state formation were actually the nomadic conquerors. Then, you know, there's uh, geographical determinism, which is used as a lens sometimes to try to explain uh, that, you know, states formed in, um, in places with certain ge- geographical characteristics river valleys at the right latitude, et cetera, et cetera. I think that theory is is valid as like a sense of gamble, like in, in the sense of like a sort of gamble uh, or or if you're dealing with probabilities. Like if you have money to gamble and you know you want to you want to spend that money wisely, then you're gonna you're gonna rely on probabilities. And geographic conditions are certainly a part of the mix. And they certainly like play a major influence on state formation. States, especially up until relatively recently, have been rather fragile institutional complexes. Uh, until relatively recently, states couldn't even survive in certain ecosystems. So they, they needed very, very gentle, optimal conditions, so to speak. So in that sense, um, if you you know if you take thousands of examples from across human history, then you're going to see much better percentages in those places, you know, that, that present those gentler, more advantageous conditions for states. That doesn't mean that the conditions created states, because if you get down into the nitty gritty, if you get down into specific examples, you can find plenty of examples that break the mold. And, and I don't think, I, it seems often that that kind of geographic or environmental determinism mostly work in hindsight. And, and I don't think, you know, they, they would have like a lot of predictive power beyond just general probabilities. You pointed out before that most stateless societies in the past have developed cultural mechanisms to reteach and constantly rearticulate why authority has to be resisted. What are some good cultural mechanisms for us to start practicing right now to articulate skepticism towards power? Uh, the, the most obvious examples for me are ones that people already do. Uh, ACAB, fuck the police, uh, you know, creating this, this very popular rejection against the police, which works in a lot of ways. And then similarly, a rejection against politicians, absolute distrust for politicians. Those work in a lot of ways. They make it more difficult for institutions of the state to infiltrate our communities and and movements uh, through community policing, through grassroots political campaigns. They have to do a lot more work because of this widespread popular distrust of those institutions and their and their agents in the case of police and politicians. Uh, those become rallying cries in moments of social conflict, uh, like the, the huge wave of, of anti-police, anti-racist revolts that, that have spread across the U.S. and many other countries across the world. They're also really helpful because they function at a metaphorical level. Within our struggles, we can, we can use these as sort of mythical figures or archetypal figures that identify behaviors that are really unhealthy to to foster within our communities. You you can say like, oh, someone's acting like a cop or someone's acting like a judge or someone's acting like a politician. 
And, you know, institutionally, they won't actually be a cop or a judge or a politician, but they are, they're modeling some kind of, of social relation, which, which we're identifying as constituting a path back towards hierarchy. And of course, there are you know certainly bad ways to to do that, as as with anything. Like you know, snitch jacketing comes comes to mind. Like I mean, that's the thing. Like if you're an anarchist, if you're an anti-authoritarian, you, you know, you can never really like just um, you know take a deep breath, let it all out, and and chill. You always have to kind of be on on the lookout. All of our all of our weapons and all of our tools can be misused. And as anarchists, we're insisting that, you know, that there's no difference between means and ends. So we have to be constantly careful about how we struggle, how we how we use these different weapons. But um, but all told, you know, it's very, very useful to have this archetype of the cop or the politician as a way to, um, you know, to, to highlight behaviors that make our struggles weaker, that turn people against one another, or that uh, help the state be reborn in the midst of our struggles, so that if, you know, anything that we ever win becomes corrupted and becomes just a new form of, of course of authority. So are those mechanisms sufficient in preventing a band of strong-willed individuals from simply taking over through sheer might and forming a new state? With very few exceptions, uh, small bands of strong-willed individuals have never been able to take over a society through sheer might. There's this uh, older theory uh, related to state formation that's been largely discredited, like the big man theory, and it just it just doesn't work out. Like uh, a bully, even you know, with a small group of followers, can't really take over a whole society. Uh, state formation needs to always have some kind of cooperative element. There needs to be uh, something in there that's convincing people to go along uh, and, and to participate. There are exceptions to that. If you have a huge inequality in military technologies, then you can get a sort of um, a warrior class conquering a large territory, conquering subject populations and forcing those populations to play the role of lower classes Although very quickly, they are going to need to find some kind of mechanism to convince those lower classes to, or at least a sufficient number of them, to participate in the new state of society that's that's being formed. But again, you know that that requires you know still like a fairly large warrior class, and it's you know it's not something that's usually done by um, particularly tiny groups. You know, there's there's examples from autonomous spaces, for example, in in Christiania. Which you know at this point is is largely a tourist trap, but um, you know farther back in its history, uh, you know definitely um, can be can be considered like a functioning, uh, impressive autonomous zone in the capital of of Denmark. Uh, so they kicked police out. Uh, they were self organizing, and you know sort of like a, a large hippie commune. And at a certain point, like a, a motorcycle gang, like a very violent motorcycle gang, tried to take over and and push uh, hard drugs. Uh, which um, was one of the few things that the the commune had decided to not allow were hard addictive drugs, whereas they did allow you know psychedelics, marijuana, et cetera. Uh, and of course, you know the police stepped back. You know they were ha- very happy to see this happen because they you know hoped that it would lead to the autonomous community falling apart. But people organized themselves and they and they kicked out the the, the mafia, the motorcycle gang. And I mean, ultimately, if we if we get the power to overthrow the state. Mm, a group of, of bullies, a group of, of strong-willed individuals trying to, to conquer us by force is, is not going to have a very easy time with us. Uh, I mean, multiple times over the last 10 years here, people, people in, in Catalonia have, have defeated you know, the full force of the police in the streets. It's happened even more recently and even more times uh, over there in the U.S. where you know, the police, you know, when there's, there's been a, um, a big revolt because of the latest police killing, you know, people are able to take over the streets and the police have been unable to, to kick people off the streets using a huge amount of violence. And then, you know, you get the <clears throat> you get the far right coming in and, you know, killing people, shooting people, running people over. And still, in most places, the movement has been strong enough to, to hold their own. So, you know, if you can just imagine the kind of capacities and practices for collective self-defense that are coming out of these movements, you know, where we're able to go toe to toe with the police and the fascists after some process of revolution, you know, these smaller groups of bullies or whatever, not 
they're not really going to have a great time with it because, you know, we can imagine that like general technology levels and, and you know, access to, to weapons and systems of, of defense will be equalized, but people will have like widespread practices of, of solidarity and, um, and self-defense. What about a large group of bullies, though? Like, it seems to me that this might imply that we need the majority of people to be on our side culturally or to believe in anti-authoritarianism at a deep level. Is that true? Uh, I mean, we want those we want those values to, to be kind of, and practices above all to become as widespread as possible, uh, although we can also see how a lot of these these different practices generalize very quickly in moments of, of social rebellion and how really people's ideas are a lot more tied to possibility than to you know these entrenched uh long lasting ethical principles like just the fact that you know in um at the end of may the majority of the u.s population was in favor of burning down the uh the police precinct in in minneapolis um, which, you know, which is like a, that's like a position that, you know, might've been unthinkable just a few months earlier. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like in, in that, the height of the rebellion, a huge portion of U S society was talking about actually abolishing the police and actually mm-hmm. giving that idea some real consideration. Uh, but that was happening in moments, mostly when the rebellion was strong, once the rebellion starts to go away, you know, then like right now, a lot more people are going to be swayed by this this democratic rhetoric that it was, you know, it was wrong. It was horrible of us to, to talk about uh, even just defunding the police. And that's why, the, you know, the, the perpetually pathetic Democratic Party didn't do better in this election because of, you know, the bad radicals who were talking about defunding the police, which, of course, doesn't doesn't hold up at all to any kind of statistical analysis of how the election played out. But, you know, I mean, they're just as bad as as the Trumpists when it comes to having any kind of dedication to like a. Uh, uh, an honest analysis backed by research. And and that actually brings us uh, really quick to another very important point regarding the George Floyd rebellion and the different rebellions connected to it that, that were spreading. They were most effectively taken apart, not by the far right and not by the police, but by the institutional left, convincing people to go home, telling people that the rioting was illegitimate, spreading conspiracy theories that it was actually the far right responsible for the rioting telling people that, you know, Trump benefited from these riots. So once again, that shows the importance of cooperation, how states need to win people's cooperation to maintain their control in the long term. So you asked about a a larger group of people taking over. That's certainly possible. And I think the most likely scenario for that, if we are imagining, you know, revolutions happening in in the near future, is that those those things happen unevenly. You know, they don't happen all over the world at at the same exact time. Anarchists often are familiar with with the Spanish Civil War, uh, but, you know, that happened at a point when, you know, the revolution had been defeated pretty much all across the world. And and it was a moment of extreme counter-revolution, whether coming from the left or the right. I guess, as a friend said once, you know, the the Spanish proletariat, like, didn't really get the memo that, um, you know, that the revolution had already been defeated. So they rose up in what was locally a very inspiring, beautiful example but most likely they didn't have a chance because, you know, they it was them against the whole world, um, the whole world, including both the left and the right again. So say there's, you know, more, um, well, obviously there will be more police murders uh, and say that sparks another another huge round of, of revolt and the U.S. government collapses, uh, you know, then, you know, you'll have Canada, the U.K., other other governments that haven't collapsed yet, you know, trying to, you know, sending peacekeepers and trying to... Um, to prop up a, a new government because, you know, they simply can't allow uh, a large part of the world to, to be stateless. So, so I think it's like, you know, less a question of like at the community level of like, you know, smaller groups of bullies endangering, endangering a stateless society and more a question of neighboring societies in which the states have not yet been abolished, trying to reconquer those territories. Uh, so that's a problem, which is why internationalism is so important. A lot of times in the past, Freedom has been identified as an ethnic quality, uh, like a, a society will overthrow the state and they will identify freedom as um, being a property of their society, of their of their their you know, linguistic community or their ethnic group, which makes obviously makes it harder um, to create wide solidarity. Now, a lot of stateless societies tend to be very welcoming. You know, they don't tend to have an essentialist idea of who belongs to the group. You know, speaking the same language helps, but they're very likely to adopt you know, other people, including refugees from neighboring state societies. But still, when freedom is identified as um, the characteristic of, of one specific group, 
then you're you're less likely to to create really really broad global networks uh, and and identify you know you and maybe you won't identify the state itself as the enemy but you'll identify you know like the the neighboring societies um you know so i don't know say um so you know being extremely optimistic say the the state collapses in in virginia which is is where i grew up but then you know it's you know, it hasn't hasn't collapsed yet in in Maryland, then, you know, you can imagine like a mentality where people, you know, identify Marylanders as the enemy and not the state as the enemy wherever, wherever it's found. So, so international, internationalism is very important. And we have examples from the 20th and the 21st century of people traveling across the world to join uh, struggles against uh, authority, to join revolutionary struggles, you know, sort of like international brigades kind of experience. And a very, very important part of that, which is, of course, always bringing the struggle home. So carrying out actions that, you know, identify the ways in which uh, state power and capitalism are also networked globally and finding the the nearest nodes of that power to, to also attack. So that's, yeah, that's vital. Really, the only way that we can defeat the state and capitalism permanently is, is through international action, because it's going to happen sooner in some places than it happens in others. Mm-hmm. I was in Marfa, Texas once, and I saw someone who looked like a veteran had this shirt on. It struck me. Um, he had this shirt on. It said, I believe it said the first thing was agitation, the second was revolution, and the third was reaction. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> like this <laughs> is this dude promoting like an accelerationism so he and his fascist buddies can fill in the vacuum that was left there by the state. The reason I bring that up is because do you think fascists are are simply wrong when they think that they could just simply take over in a post-state society? I mean, I, I think I might have asked you that already, so feel free to pass if if you think you've answered that sufficiently. But um, I mean, I can, uh, yeah, like address that specifically. I, I think it's very obvious that fascists and most most people in mainstream society have a very incorrect idea of at least like the range of possibility of what revolutions can look like. I also suspect, and you know, obviously a lot more research would be needed, but I suspect that maybe um, state of society has never actually collapsed in human history. In the pure sense of that word, uh, because you know states have have um, survived some some very huge crises and and come out of them stronger, you know, reacting opportunistically. And also, many times, states can't survive uh, crises and and they fall apart. But I would suspect that they only fall apart when there's a push from below. When when we start to act strategically, when we recognize that the state is weakened, and we organize ourselves to fight back. Because uh, if we're just, you know, sitting around waiting as as spectators, then, you know, the state means that you already have a lot of people and a lot of resources mobilized to act strategically to maintain and extend their power. So if we're not making that more difficult for them, then, then it's probably not going to succeed. You know, so again, like there's this tendency to to see things just happening by themselves or to happening, you know, happening in like in a sort of uh, mechanical way. But you know you can have stronger and weaker struggles that that might result in in the collapse of the state. So we need to be ready to you know to fight back, to take over space, to liberate territory, and then we also need to be we need to be ready to defend that territory, to defend those new social relations that we're creating from you know the onslaught, the reactionary onslaught, whether it's uh, you know from fascists or you know whether you know they're, the neighboring state is organizing some expeditionary force to um, to reimpose control. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it earlier, but are there any other examples of stateless societies in existence today? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, I mean, there's there's obviously nowhere on the planet that's been untouched by by capitalism uh, and the state, but there are places where where people can still you know have a lot a large high degree of, of autonomy. They still have you know a territory that they can protect. I mean, some of some of the main areas at this point would be. Like you know, in in the Amazon, in the African interior, and and say like in in like the Highland area in Southeast Asia or New Guinea. But again, like you know, I, I think it's it can be like a little bit dangerous to talk about that because you know a lot of people, like especially white people, can have this idea of you know some kind of like untouched land before time, and you know might imagine stateless peoples as being ahistorical. 
uh, which they're not, you know, it's just like other societies like ours who, you know, found probably a much, much better, healthier way to survive, but, you know, their, their territory is threatened by logging companies, by mining companies and, and so on and so forth. Like one, one example that like, you know, Western anthropologists have written about. So, you know, they're more like read about more, more known in the West would be like the Mbuti in Central Africa, but, you know, they're facing like, you know, absolutely genocidal conditions with, with cold hand mining and, and deforestation in the Aturi forest. And then, and then, you know, then there's also like what qualifies as stateless, like when you have societies that are colonized in the Americas, but their traditional form of organization is stateless. And they remember still that traditional form of organization, that traditional culture, and, you know, they practice it every opportunity they get. But, you know, they're also existing under the, under the, the jurisdiction and the military might of a colonizing country. So there's like a, it's also a certain kind of statelessness that's, that's very important. So it's less a question of like, you know, groups of humans that are like pure and untouched and more a question of, of resistance against colonialism as, as a constant ongoing activity. And in another book you wrote called How Nonviolence Protects the State, you explain how liberals have whitewashed famous historical figures involved in resistance struggles and also how these defanged narratives protect power. Can you explain how the masses internalize these unquestioned narratives? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we all grew up uh, learning learning history a certain way, like in public school, they'll briefly mention you know, you know, there was uh, segregation and it was bad, but then it got solved because of, of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. So it's like, you know, very, very rushed, very superficial narrative of history, which is communicating like this fundamental moral perspective about the world we live in, which is that um, it's based on legitimacy. It's based on consent of the governed. It's based on some kind of ethical decency. So if there's an injustice happening, it's maybe only happening because it's been hidden. So, you know, as, as far as like segregation goes, that's like a very like laughable New England perspective, seeing like the, the South as this, uh, you know, this sort of dark, inscrutable jungle where, you know, such abnormal things as oppression can be safely hidden away, you know, or it can be hidden by, by prejudice, by uneducation. So, you know, it was possible, segregation was possible because, because Southerners had been, you know, white Southerners had been um, brought up, you know, believing, believing these prejudices. So that's, I mean, and so then therefore what you have to do is you just have to shine a light on it. You have to show people, oh, this is oppression, this is wrong, and then it's all going to work out. And, you know, that's laughable for a lot of reasons, like the, like the pretension of, of white Northerners in the U.S. that, you know, they're not racist, that they just hadn't, you know, reworked racism to work in a, in a different and oftentimes more efficient way. Uh, or that the state actually gives a damn. Like states uh, historically are very much tied to to slavery and and to forced labor of some kind. Uh, like that's one one of the few generalizations that can be made about states is that pretty much always states require coerced labor, people working uh, regardless of their of their consent. So yeah, so you know, of course, like the like the U.S. government didn't give a shit about slavery, didn't give a shit about segregation, has been like a major purveyor. Of, of white supremacy in, in one form or another, but it's a comforting narrative. People like to believe that. People like to believe that, um, first of all, that we're free. Like if you, if you, you know, take a radical view of how white supremacy has evolved and how it is completely attached to the everyday functioning of the state and capitalism, then I mean, like the, like the bottom line of that is that none of us are free. Uh, the bottom line of that is that we live in some manner of totalitarian society that has certain laws that it must uphold. And those laws are related to exploitation, to the accumulation of capital, to the accumulation of power. And, and our, our two choices are, are either to um, you know, play along and hope that some of the wealth trickles down to us or to, to fight against that. Uh, it's very comforting to think that you know, just by shining a light on, on a problem that it's going to get better. So yeah, so people buy into those narratives because there's a, a superficial analysis of, of, you know, what racism is or what, you know, what constitutes economic oppression. And, you know, we get very little information about how those stories played out. Now, that's an interesting point um, that, that I could go into. How is it they keep that information from that? Because... Like, you know, that was us in the struggles of the 70s, the 60s and the 50s. Like that was, uh, you know, that, unless you're coming from like, you know, a, like a completely upper class background, that was just, you know, earlier generations of us who was there fighting. 
uh, or, you know, in at the, at the very least, like, sympathetic to those struggles you know, like, you know like you know a lot of white people definitely like stayed on the sidelines of that struggle but at the very least we're, we're sympathetic to it so how is it that that all that memory was lost that that memory didn't get passed down why is it that we have to get those memories from the state itself from the public school system or from documentaries on pbs uh, it's because of a huge amount of state violence a huge amount of repression that had the result of so many of the people who who actually participated in that struggle getting killed or getting locked away in prison, getting traumatized by really horrible experiences, having their communities flooded with with addictive drugs, and then a lot of the the people who were privileged on one access or another by by the society. So, for example, a lot of white people copying a deal, basically agreeing to buy in to this more superficial narrative of what constituted oppression. Uh, you know, getting jobs in the university, uh, getting, you know, high paying jobs or, you know, decent paying jobs elsewhere and just moving on, forgetting about it and and not telling the next generations what actually happened because they're busy making themselves forget what really happened. Because if they're honest with themselves about what really happened, then they have to be honest with themselves about, you know, the, the actual the, the society that they live in. So, yeah, so that's I, I think in a nutshell, a very maybe large 15 minute long nutshell the general mechanism of how um, how people can be convinced by these whitewashed nonviolent narratives. Mm-hmm. Can you touch on how there were, in fact, violent elements within movements surrounding MLK or Gandhi and also why it's important to understand that that was the case? Yeah. So fortunately, you know, these these histories are are starting to become better known in the anti-racist struggle in the U.S. in the 50s, the 60s, and 70s. Black veterans coming back, having having, uh, fought in World War II, uh, having weapons, knowing how to use weapons. They played a really important role. Both the reformist and revolutionary strains of of organizing, especially in the South, like even even the, you know, the strategies and the formations that Martin Luther King is associated with, these, you know, nonviolent reformist parts of the movement couldn't have happened without armed black self-defense. So, you know, there's like Robert Williams, who, who wrote an important book, Negroes with Guns, talking about the NAACP chapter that he was in in uh, uh, North Carolina. And they focused largely on on arming black folks. And, you know, that was um, at least, you know, being the NAACP, it certainly started out as more of a, a reformist expression of that struggle than a revolutionary one. Well, of course, the Williams, uh, you know, certainly radicalized. Uh, you know, you have later on, obviously, very important groups like the Black Panther Party and, and many other groups similar to them that, uh, you know, had a revolutionary vision that practiced and preached armed self-defense. Uh, groups like the Black Liberation Army that carried out attacks, that carried out expropriations, attacked police. So this this was a, you know, a movement that that used a very wide diversity of tactics and that used many, many forceful tactics. And then, you know, going beyond groups, we can look at also kind of more spontaneous uprisings. Everybody knows about Martin Luther King Jr.'s campaign in um, in Birmingham, Alabama, and pretty much no one knows about the one in Albany, Georgia, which is funny because they, they actually kind of switched out the histories. The image that were sold of the campaign in Birmingham was really more what happened in Albany, Georgia, because that was a completely peaceful campaign based just on civil disobedience on, you know, people voluntarily getting arrested doing sit-ins and stuff like that. But Albany failed, which is why they never talk about it. It was a complete failure. And this whole idea that, that, you know, they could fill up the jails if they got enough people arrested, it didn't work out. They started shipping people to, you know, to other counties, other states, the jails were bottomless. The nonviolence campaign in Albany failed. In Birmingham, it started out as a nonviolence campaign, but the the locals uh, rejected the discipline of you know these higher class professional organizers coming from out of town uh, with um, you know the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and and other groups. They didn't see the dignity in letting themselves get beat up by the police. They revolted. They beat the police. They burned all the white businesses in Central Birmingham, and they, they actually you know that's what won the desegregation of Birmingham. And within a month. The federal government, after dragging their their feet for years, uh, finally agreed to to support civil rights legislation. So even the reformist victories were won by you know things like massive rioting and fighting with police. Similar with the independence movement in India, of course everyone knows about Gandhi because you know the the winners write the history books, and it's in the interest of power that we know about Gandhi, but not that we know about him too much. For example, they don't want us to know that. 
you know, when, when he was in South Africa, he was actually supporting uh, British colonial war efforts against, against uh, native South African populations. So, you know, they'll, they'll leave out things that don't present like this simplified hero narrative. And they will certainly leave out uh, revolutionaries like Bharat Singh, Chandra Sekhar Azad. They'll leave out how the, the whole question around tactics was a very live debate in the Indian uh, uh, National Congress and how at times, um, you know, Gandhi was by no means in the majority position. That There were major strikes, there were riots, there were uprisings, there were assassinations of British colonial officials. Uh, and all of those things together forced the, the British to, to negotiate, to realize that they needed to make some change there. But in negotiations, they negotiated with the pacifists, they negotiated with the reformists, and, and they, they basically, you know, saw how, what, what was another uh, system that would still promote British interests specifically and capitalist interests more broadly. And that's, you know, the very limited victory that was won there. It's important to be aware of, of, of these histories, because otherwise, I mean, history informs theory very, very closely. And otherwise, you know, if, if we're not aware of how how we've won, even these very limited partial victories in the past, then we completely set ourselves up for, for failure. So a lot of people in the U.S. somehow think that the Vietnam War was ended by a peaceful protest movement, which is just completely laughable. There were some peaceful protests, but there was no peaceful protest movement in, in the U.S. It was a very, very combative, illegal movement that included thousands of bombings and other attacks on recruiting offices, on universities where they were developing developing weapons and military technologies. Most importantly, there was the armed resistance of the, of the Vietnamese people themselves, without which there would have been pretty much zero resistance uh, coming from the coming from the states. So it's you know quite a bit racist to just sort of leave leave out that part of the equation. And then on the U.S. side, the most important thing weren't any of the protests, whether they were riots or not happening in the U.S. It was actually um, the revolutionary activity and the complete lack of discipline on the part of the U.S. military itself, where they were they were assassinating their own officers. They were refusing to go out on patrol. Uh, they were they were mutinying. And, you know, you can actually read the, the documents of the U.S. military where they where they say that they need to pull the military uh, out of Vietnam or they're going to lose their army. Uh, I mean, you know, that's a, a pretty compelling argument and, and certainly shows that, you know, what they were worried about were not these peaceful protesters walking in circles around the White House. Nonetheless, proponents of nonviolence in the U.S. sold like they, they ate their own lies. They, they created this completely falsified history for purely ideological reasons, just to protect their, their comfort politics. Basically, they, they lied to themselves and then they bought it. And so they actually thought that they stopped the Vietnam War through peaceful protest. Fast forward to 2003, uh, the Bush administration is, is getting ready to invade Iraq again. And you have, uh, in March of 2003, the largest peaceful protests in world history happening all around the world. The vast majority of those protests uh, are peaceful, um, certainly all throughout the U.S. And, you know, it's, it's they're the largest protests in, in human history. All of these nonviolent organizations that were involved in organizing those protests and making sure that, you know, I can um, went to one of those protests and, uh, you know, they wouldn't even let us walk in the street. They made sure that we stayed on the sidewalk. So it was just like, you know, extreme nonviolence. They were they were elated after the protests and they they were actually stupid enough to go on the Internet and and to openly say that now it would be impossible for the U.S. to invade Iraq because of just that huge outpouring of people power that had been demonstrated. You know, there was so much opposition to the war that that it, it just wouldn't be possible anymore. And of course, we all saw how that how that ended up. You know, more than more than a million people dead, thanks in part to nonviolence proponents prioritizing their own comfort politics over any sense of honesty, decency, or, or historical memory. So yeah, it's it's absolutely important to to remember how how these struggles actually go down. Emma Goldman was skeptical of women's suffrage because I think she saw it as a step towards integration rather than liberation. Can the same be said about civil rights? And what are your thoughts generally on reformism versus revolution? Yeah, um, so I'm I'm white, of course. So things like uh, segregation or lack of civil rights are are not something that that affect me directly. So I mean, 
people should take anything I say about civil rights with a grain of salt because I, you know, I can't speak from experience and therefore I can't speak with any any expertise. I think in general, to draw a pattern, we can say that, you know, even if we agree with Emma Goldman that voting is some bullshit, symbols are important. And when you live in a society that symbolically places you on a lower level and says, you know, oh, you can't vote or you have to use a different um, drink from a different water fountain, you know, that that's real. Like saying that something symbolic is is that's not synonymous with saying that it's unreal or that it's not meaningful. Humans are symbolic creatures. So symbols have have very, very real impacts on our, our lives, on our health and and so forth. So, on, you know, on that level, you know, things like like struggles for civil rights are, are certainly important. However, on the other level, you know, the, there are plenty of, of black revolutionaries who, who articulated very, very clearly why they weren't just fighting for change in laws, but they were fighting for a revolution because they saw the ways that capitalism and white supremacy were intrin- intrinsically linked up uh, and, and couldn't be gotten rid of just with, uh, with a change, uh, change of laws. So there are, there are very obviously deeper oppressions, deeper problems uh, happening, and, and we need to have we need to have a radical analysis to understand them, radical in the sense of going to the roots. So, um, yeah, I, I am critical of reformism. I, I, uh, I think we need to we need to be revolutionaries. We need to to believe in revolution and understand how that how that might happen uh, with the ways that society is organized today. And we need I mean, we need to dig deep. We need to find the roots of Leviathan, of um, of the state, capitalism and patriarchy. Look at the ways that they're all tied together, that they support one another and get rid of them, burn them down, transform them into other things, create new social relations that, that reflects, you know, completely other, other logics uh, based in solidarity, based in mutual aid and, and so on. And reform is, is also dangerous because it's, it's one of the uh, most effective ways that states have for defeating our struggles and for basically updating, updating oppression and authority and allowing it to continue in a new and often more effective form. So, yeah, so we can see that with the Green New Deal uh, being sort of a pipeline to get government money to to green capitalist enterprises. We can see it with like, you know, the the perversions of the the call to abolish police being turned into a call to defund police being turned into a call for, I don't know, two body cameras on every cop now or, you know, more sensitivity training. (laughs) I can't remember what state it was in, but just recently uh, a cop who was in charge of the sensitivity and anti-discrimination trainings for the other cops in their department, they were caught going on on message boards and anonymously leaving racist, anti-Semitic, and and sexist comments. So mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like anything short of abolishing the police is it's just a fucking lie, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and we can't trust it. So sometimes the dichotomy of re- reformism versus revolution is is very unhelpful, and I think it's unhelpful when it is making a division or a split between uh, long-term uh, or total changes and between immediate survival measures that people need right now. Uh, in, in, a re- in, like, in a truly revolutionary uh, practice, those things always go hand in hand. We're always looking for ways to create uh, strong relationships between our revolutionary horizons and dreams and revolutionary ethics, um, you know, like ideas of, of never separating the ends and means, um, uh, acting in solidaristic horizontal ways, and uh, actions that respond to our immediate needs right now that make life a little bit more possible uh, right now, you know, supporting each other. So, like, you know, mutual aid projects can can sometimes kind of bridge that gap. So, so. If we're talking about revolution and reform, we should never be making like a long-term, short-term division or anything like that. What what we should be doing is um, talking about imagination and and the scope of our analysis. For me, there's a div- division between a revolutionary or reformist approach if we're being completely unrealistic and naive about how deep a certain oppression runs. Um, so in that sense, I would say that it, it's reformism to, you know, decrease the, the police budget by by 5% or more uh, sensitivity trainings. Like, you know, that's that's when that's when it's an activity that's probably just going to make make our struggles weaker. Anarchism emphasizes cooperation and eliminating coercion as a means by which we interact with one another. Someone new to anarchism might find it perplexing that one could advocate violence while seeking peace. 
Also, some anarchists might claim that if we want a free society, uh, a society without the state or capitalism, we have a responsibility to be an example of new behavioral norms that we advocate. How do you deal with those perceived tensions? Yeah, uh, violence is a very vague category. I think it's not very uh, useful for talking about tactics just because such completely different actions can be can be painted with the same label. As an anarchist, I believe in you know our means and ends going together, and I believe in in using tactics that are compatible compatible with the kind of world that I want to live in. Uh, I'm not a pacifist. I, I want to live in a world in which people do practice self defense, in which you know people don't always wait for some collective to save them. You know, going and and you know hitting someone or or you know fighting with with weapons should never be the first should never be the first option, but. I want to live in a society in which if people see that there's no chance at dialogue and there's no chance at coexisting peacefully with uh, with certain others that, you know, that, you know, we'll we'll do what we have to to defend ourselves and to keep those others from conquering their neighbors, from from recreating authority. So the whole question of, of anarchists holding themselves to really high standards, I, I think it's necessary to do so. And and oftentimes that's been one of anarchist strengths like being able to present these examples of solidaristic behavior of mutual aid creating the revolution right now um on the other hand it you know certainly creates a lot of stress you know we're we're not better than anyone else we're not going to be able to um you know to always be exemplary if there's a strong pressure to always pretend to be exemplary then you know we're only going to facilitate hypocrisy we're going to you know facilitate uh, unhealthy dynamics that we can't call out so i think it's it's important to always strive to put our ideals into practice and strive to create examples of revolutionary practices and relationships right now but only if we can also recognize that it's impossible to fully put revolutionary and liberatory relations into practice as long as the state and capitalism and patriarchy still exist. So it's, it's this anarchist paradox that basically that like, you know, the revolution is the process by which people win the ability, gain the ability or develop the ability to, um, to organize themselves and to create these, uh, these revolutionary social relationships. It's like a Bakun quote or something like you can only learn how to be free in freedom, basically. Have the recent riots and burnings of police stations yielded any positive results? And what are your thoughts generally surrounding the uprisings? The uprisings have been extremely inspiring. Uh, I think they also need to be understood in their immediate historical context to understand the, the results or the effects. It was only since people started habitually fighting back against police murders and police racism that you've seen any legal consequences for cops in the U.S. You know, up until about 10 years ago, the Oscar Grant rebellion, Mike Brown rebellion, you know, up until then, like, you know, the cops would would kill someone and it just meant like, you know, a brief paid vacation and then like back to normal and never, they would never have any consequences. So that's one thing, like the fact that, you know, even though this is something that's coming from the state, uh, the fact that cops are, are less likely to be able to do this with impunity. Probably more important than that is is just how much it's changed people's sense of what's possible. The fact that you can have a conversation go totally mainstream about abolishing the police, which you know previously was was an idea that was very marginalized by the mainstream, that's a huge accomplishment and that's really important. Of course, that's not a change, you know, that's not a structural change in itself, but it's it's a necessary step to to get to any change. It also makes it really clear, you know, who our enemies are. That we can see how much. Democrats have been pushing back against that idea. We can see how much NGOs have been perverting that idea in into you know a chance for maybe more 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 money. You know if they can like position themselves as the ones doing um, sensitivity trainings or whatever. And most of all, people need to realize that we are powerful. People need to realize that we can fight back. That that we can create our own justice. We can we can shut police stations down uh, and worse. And that that is definitely a, a prerequisite to any any radical change, any any real deep rooted change in society. What are the best tactics for ending the state? And are there any you think we should definitely avoid? I think tactics have to be decided in relation to a specific struggle, a specific situation. Uh, you know, they're, they're tools. You have to fit. You have to pick the right tool for the job. 
there are very few tactics that, that I would say just across the board need to be uh, avoided or abandoned or denounced or whatever. And those are those are ones that that at least, you know, as, as near as I can tell, only ever reproduce uh, status dynamics or, or relations of domination and, and hierarchy. So basically like torture and locking people up in cages. You know, those those are those are tactics that uh you know even even anarchists who have who have assassinated kings and presidents have, you know, forsworn things like uh torture or or you know forcing people to live in cages, uh any kind of like you know long, long term systematic punishment. Um and I think that makes perfect sense because I don't I don't see how you know how a, a tactic like that could fit into um to like a healthier, freer world. All right. So towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be very compliant with this one. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, people who are, who are good at being very concise, all power to them. But but I, I think it's it's just as likely to end up as a kind of more, um, I don't know, more, like maybe a more superficial format for me, at least. Yeah, well, if you go over the minute, the anarchist cops are are on their way. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, so the the first one on the list is academia. Um, I, I think it's a useful tool for people who recognize that it is a very important part of the power structure we're fighting against. So, if they're going to get resources, if they're going to do research for struggles that make our struggles uh, smarter and more effective. Uh, then you know, good, but just you know, be aware of the privileges involved, and and you know, don't um, don't don't stand in front. Uh, and if you know people are doing it so that they can come and study our movements, um, fuck off. <laughs> All right, veganism. Uh, I guess the big question is 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 it a you know a diet that someone is doing to um, because personally that's how they feel healthiest and and best with the world. Or is it something that they're trying to impose on everyone else with no idea of uh, how potentially colonialistic that is uh, or all of the um, the potential overlap with green capitalism, uh, seeing as how, you know, plenty of progressive political parties and like the United Nations even have been uh, have been promoting veganism. Mm -hmm. Exarchia. A beautiful neighborhood, a beautiful history of struggle, facing difficult time, a lot of uh, police repression, all power to them. Municipalism. Seems to me that uh, that democracy started out as a as a system intimately connected to patriarchy and and slavery, and uh, you know as a democratic system, it worked perfectly fine with groups of like thirty thousand, fifty, sixty thousand people. So to me, it seems uh, fairly naive. All right, whiteness. Fuck it, destroy it. It's terrible. It's uh, it's poison. Yeah, I mean, it's not something that, you know, you can just walk away from. But uh, hopefully everyone who has been saddled with whiteness is, is doing what they can to understand where it comes from and uh, what results it has and, and you know, doing our best to betray it. And, you know, all all power to everyone who's who's on the other side of that fucking razor wire fence and, uh, and, and fighting against it because it's an assault on their very freedom, dignity and survival. Burn it down. I had someone call me to do a random political poll, mm -hmm. and um, they asked me my ethnicity. I told them I was recently white. <laughs> I don't think they understood what that meant, but... All right, so good job on the lightning round. The anarchist police will not be coming to your door. I think you, you finished under a minute on every single one of those, so good job. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> That's All right. So um, we have some listener questions and then we'll, 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 we'll be at the actual end of, of our conversation here. Okay. All right. All right. So the first listener question is, what should we do to prevent a smart Trump from emerging in 2024? Uh, I mean, we can't prevent a smart Trump from emerging, but maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Maybe it's more in terms of like how, how to keep a smart Trump from winning either the Republican nomination or, or the presidential elections. Um, yeah, I think the fear is like, yeah, you have an idiot touting like populist, white nationalist sort of rhetoric. But what if you get someone in there who's actually articulate? Yeah, I mean, they have, uh, you know, they have articulate politicians who are, who are every bit as, as far right as Trump. So, that, you know, that's an interesting question of, you know, why was there like some kind of effective selection process that gave us Trump instead of that other one? Was it only because Trump already had a lot of name recognition or was actually Trump's extreme stupidity a part of his 
his appeal because that's, I mean, that's certainly been a Republican trend for a while. Like, you know, folks who remember like in, in 2000, like the, just the level of, of George W. Bush's stupidity was, it was just fucking mind blowing. Like, I mean, at the time it was like, <laughs> like no one had ever seen someone who was like that inarticulate and like that ridiculously stupid. Uh, it just felt insulting to like have to listen to him. And then like, you know, Trump comes along and, and lowers the bar, but that doesn't mean that, um, I mean, I mean, Ronald Reagan managed to, uh, you know, finish out his presidential term brain dead, like after taking a bullet in the brain. So it seems to be uh, like, a, like a long term part of um, right wing populism, Republican populism, at least to have stupid candidates. And, you know, that's that's something that, you know, that can be analyzed, that has been analyzed. So would they prefer like an articulate Trump? Maybe, maybe not. Would they prefer one who knows how to work the bureaucracy better? Absolutely. Uh, Trump was not a very effective president in a lot of ways. I mean, he did a, a huge amount of harm, but a lot of his policies and actions got shot down frequently because of his own incompetence. So you could have like another, you know, completely like macho racist with like a hundred word vocabulary who can't string together a complete sentence, but one who who doesn't try to go to go it alone, you know, even against his own party so much, who doesn't like broadcast his his uh I mean, but that's another problem. So Trump often broadcast his own intentions, like, you know, like for like the, his like attempted at a Muslim, a Muslim ban. It was very easy for the courts to shoot that down because Trump made it clear on Twitter what the actual intention of the, of the ban was. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, you know, that's, that's one of the things that got him support. The fact that he was willing to speak so openly about the actual purposes of some of these racist laws or racist policies that he was trying to enact. So we, I mean, we can't, we're not really going to determine uh, the politics in the Republican Party, what we need to do is keep struggling. Uh, but I think like the most important thing, I mean, if you have like, you know, the, the how far right the Democratic Party has gone, I mean, like, I'm not sure how much how much better the next four years are going to be. So the most important thing is for us to keep strengthening our movements, to make our movements every bit as resistant against uh, right wing and police violence as they are resistant against the, the recuperation tactics coming from the institutional left, including including the center, <clears throat> center left. Remembering that, you know, I mean, in according to a lot of people's analysis and what we saw in a lot of cities, it was actually the institutional left that was more effective at pacifying and and stopping the anti-racist rebellions of this past year. So, so we can't, I mean, we can't have like any kind of simplistic binary analysis where the only thing that we're afraid of is the right, because that it's just, I mean, historically it's ignorant, practically it, it doesn't work. We need to have, you know, like a, a more depthful theory in which we can pay attention to the dangers coming from every side and, and, you know, having, you know, in addition to that, you know, more, more complex theory that's, that's um, aware of the dangers of both repression and recuperation tying together practices of collective self-defense, expropriation, like the, like the lootings we saw, and mutual aid, putting our ideas for survival, our practices for survival and for taking care of one another, uh, putting them out there in the streets, making them work, and, and making sure that they don't get recuperated either as like, you know, like the nice friendly neighborhood project, but they stay connected to these practices of, of self-defense and fighting back. Right. In Worshipping Power, you talk about how the Dark Ages were dark only to the people in power, and also how destroying language and written documents wasn't so dark to those whose lives were being made legible by documents. Can you expound on that, and do you have any resources you'd recommend folks look into in order to learn more about it? Yeah, for, for reading about legibility, definitely check out James C. Scott, for example, The Art of Not Being Governed. It's a, it's a really good work on the idea of you know, how the state is this entity that's you know trying to peer into our lives from above, and we can be organized in a way that that makes it impossible, that they can't really tell you know what the hell we're doing, what we're thinking, or we can be organized in a way that we're, we're transparent, that society is essentially a panopticon prison. And they can see, you know, what we're doing, what we're thinking, why, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, in the, the present situation, I think the most important thing to, to say about this is um, social media technologies. Like everyone has invited the state into, into their head. They trace their, their own movements. They track themselves uh, for the state and for capitalism. They, they lay bare, you know, all of their, 
their relationships, their social connections. And, you know, that's just like hugely problematic. It's, you know, maybe a bit nostalgic, but um, about 10 years ago, a little bit more in some places, a little bit less than others, we were doing actually like a really good job of having a fairly global network of counter information infrastructure, like our own you know, sort of like news uh, spreading uh, websites and communication infrastructures. People were learning how to, you know, how to use encryption, encryption when it wasn't, you know, just automatic uh, and, you know, our own email servers and stuff like that. And then the minute something convenient came along, you know, people just, everyone just like abandoned ship and opened a Facebook or, you know, like at best, you know, maybe got some app that was a little bit more security conscious, but, you know, security you know, it has to, it has to exist at every level. So it's not really effective if it's only existing at one level. But anyways, yeah, it's, um, we're living in a moment of near total transparency, near total legitimacy. Uh, and there's a voluntary aspect to that. There's also an involuntary aspect to that. I mean, if you don't have a smartphone, then you're, you're pretty much unemployable in most sectors. But um, I haven't exactly seen people, you know, dragging their feet or, you know, being, being pulled off into that world of total legibility, kicking and screaming. Yeah. I guess there's something to be said about making freedom convenient, you know? Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, their, their version of freedom. Right, right. Another listener asks or points out global warming, fascism, COVID-19, the threat of civil war. It can be overwhelming to parse out what to tackle first. How do we prioritize all of these threats that we find ourselves under today? Uh, look at where you're at. Look at who's around you. Look at the conflicts that are already closer to the surface and, you know, pull at those scenes. Anarchist strategy is very different from status strategy in that it's not like looking down at society like a chessboard where you know, we have to inhabit our own bodies, but also bodies in a more collective sense, inhabit our own territory and look out from in, see what possibilities we have, see what, you know, what, what are the most vulnerable fracture points or the most live hot conflicts around us and, you know, throw ourselves into the breach, take part there, but always making the connections, uh, never allowing these to become single issue fights. There's a connection between ecological crisis and, you know, the growth in the far right and border crises and capitalism strategies for getting out of it. Uh, so we need to always talk in, in a way that, uh, that makes it clear that it's all connected. Yeah. All right. Two more listener questions and then we'll be finished. Second to last is what shape will fascist organizing take under a Biden presidency and how do we deal with it? That's an important question. Um, I think I think I'm going to pass because they're you know they're like I, I'm not living. I go back to the states when I can, but I'm not living there now. And there there are people who who do a lot more research in into the fascists. Um, so I would I would you know just advise people to to pay attention to folks who have been doing more research in um, in the fascists with um, with two caveats. Uh, one is that okay, give it give it another week or so before like taking this with any certainty. But by the look of it now, it seems like there was a pretty gross uh, exaggeration of the capacities of fascists in the U.S. I mean, we, you know, we've had months of like talks of like, uh, you know, coming forthcoming coup and whatnot. Um, and they've they've had a fairly weak showing. Uh, you know, we'll also see how things go down tonight since most media outlets have, have just started announcing a... Um, a Biden win. Um, I'm not sure when you're going to area this, but, you know, right now it's uh, November 7th. Um, so, you know, maybe they'll, they'll go on the attack tonight. But so far, the fascists have had a much weaker showing than, than, what, a lot, than what was being predicted out of a lot of quarters. Uh, so on the one hand, that, you know, that shows the importance of, of organizing, like, you know, just having guns and like big shitty opinions isn't enough. And like the lack of actual organizing by fascists made it so that they couldn't really manifest as a social presence throughout these, these days of disputed elections. And so that, that also means that people should look at, okay, the different outlets that have been following the fascists, which ones made accurate predictions, which ones made less accurate predictions, and most importantly, which ones are honest. So of all the ones that were, you know, more or less inaccurate, which ones are actually um, being honest about that and like, you know, like conducting some like self-criticism and like trying to understand like, okay, what was wrong with our, with our theoretical framework that led us to, to make this mistake? And then which ones try to cover it up, you know, probably by, you know, like rushing on to like the next big emergency and, and you know, sense of exaggerated and often misplaced alarm. Uh, so, so yeah, people should do that in deciding like, you know, which of like the different currents that are researching the fascists to actually take seriously and to pay attention to. And then the only other thing is, um, 
you know the fascists are are dangerous. Uh, they're you know they're they're murderous. They're a problem. And anti-fascist organizing in the states has been very effective at responding to and sometimes neutralizing that threat over the last uh, really five years. And that's that's been uh, you know an important victory. Uh, but never to, to to take that out of the overall democratic context in which you also have uh, you know attempts to. Um, to pacify our movement uh, coming from the institutional left, coming from the Democratic Party. So always, you know, understand those different, those very, very different threats, both in context and in, in proportion, which is, you know, it's it's a lot harder to double the work, but it's the only way to, to keep our movement strong. Thank you for that. Okay, so the last listener question and a question that we ask on almost every interview is, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? <laughs> um, where do you live, roughly? Uh, if you just want to say the basic I, region, or everyone knows, I, I live in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think coffee coffee uh, can grow there. So um, uh, you know, if like the the utopia that I like to imagine, you know, has a lot of respect and love for the the planet, and so most communities or communities generally um, grow the vast majority of their food themselves, you know, so it's not an economy that's based on, you know, the transportation of a huge amount of goods all the way across the planet, just because, you know, people like to eat tomatoes when they're out of season or, you know, folks in the North like to eat oranges or whatever. Um, however, it's also a utopia in which people travel a lot. People love to travel. People have like a, you know, very um, like uh, international networks of, of friendships and sharing and community and, and so forth. So um, I guess, yeah, you know, like when you go travel, I'm not sure what, what's good in San Antonio, but you take, take a lot of that with you, give it out as presents uh, on the way. And, you know, likewise, like um, if you uh, had, had some visitor coming from, I guess, closest to you would be uh, uh, Central America, you know, they're like, you know, traveling, giving presentations about, I don't know, the different techniques that they're developing uh, down there for um, electricity generation that's, you know, not dependent on massive destructive infrastructures, like either, mm -hmm. either petroleum nor like huge wind farms or anything. So they're, you know, up visiting you, uh, giving that presentation, you know, then like maybe they stay at your house or like you cook them a nice meal or something and they give you like a good you know bag of uh coffee beans but yeah in, in my utopia you might not be able to depend on uh on you know every day having having a product that comes from another part of the planet so there will be coffee but just not uh not as a, a consumer product that people assume that they have a right to that trumps the survival and dignity of people on the planet <laughs> that, that's been one of the more interesting answers to that question i think i've ever heard on this show oh good all right <laughs> Where can people go to follow you and your work? In the last year, I have uh, made a, a huge compromise with um, this uh, big, ugly uh, technological system that I despise. And so I am um, on Twitter doing, I don't, I don't know what, but I, I, um, I post there sometimes. That's just yeah, my name and my last name, at Peter Gelderlos, on Twitter. Um, and then pretty much every time I write a new article or, or text, uh, myself or someone else puts it up on the anarchist library. So a lot of, a lot of my writings on there. Uh, and then yeah, worshiping power you can get from AK press, um, how nonviolence protects the state, uh, detritus books or, or active distribution in the UK. Um, yeah. Anarchy works. Anyways, most of that fortunately has been, has been pirated and is also for free, uh, somewhere on the interwebs. Peter Gelderlos. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate you coming on. I think folks are really gonna enjoy this conversation. And um, yeah, everyone needs to go check out Peter's work. And Peter, we'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Yeah, that would be nice. Take care, everyone. You know, keep on keeping on, stay strong, take care of each other. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my conversation with Peter Gelderlos. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at youtube.com slash media. Also, be sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new video. If you'd like to see this project continue, consider contributing financially at patreon.com slash media. And if you can't help out financially, be sure to like and share this episode. I also want to remind everyone that we do have a Twitter account. Be sure to follow us there as well. Our handle is at media. 
Finally, I wanted to announce that we are working on a new website and plan to have that up and running very soon. Obviously, keep an eye out for that as well. Thank y'all so much for sticking with us as we complete our second year as a podcast. I say it all the time, but your support really does mean the world to us. And it's only because of you that we're able to continue. I'd like to leave everyone with a philosophical rock in their shoe and conclude this episode with words spoken by Ursula K. Le Guin. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. <laughs> Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art, the art of words.